Okay, first of all, good morning, and thanks the organizers of this conference to allow me to speak to you. And <clears throat> before I start talking about the nuclear energy option, uh, perhaps you have asked yourself, and I asked myself, why actually a particle physicist is invited to talk to you about <clears throat> a particular question on, using, uh, on producing energy. Now, you might know that we at CERN, and in doing particle physics, we have nothing to do with energy production. We are not even thinking about energy production. We are just consuming a lot of energy to do our basic field of research. Now, I came up with two explanations. One is we are a bunch of stupid idealists who sometimes come up with a good idea, but in general, we are too stupid to become rich of this idea. <clears throat> a more kind explanation might be that we are stupid idealists, but we work on some kind of fundamental truth of nature and actually we don't care if he likes this truth or not. So you have to decide at the end what it's all about. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the nuclear energy options, and <clears throat> I will go into nuclear fission and give some arguments about the status and perspective of conventional reactors, fast breeders, generation for power plants, and perspectives of uranium extraction. And then I come to nuclear fusion, and I will try to explain you why <coughs> deuterium tritium fusion will not lead to commercial energy production. Okay. So, unfortunately, because of time constraints, there are a lot of issues which cannot be covered. And <coughs> just shortly, this is the physics of nuclear fission and fusion energy, nuclear fission <coughs> energy and its relation to nuclear weapons, the real and imagined health effects from alpha, gamma, and beta radiation, problems of nuclear waste, <clears throat> the question if nuclear fission energy is really CO2-free, and why high-energy physics is fascinating, even so it has nothing to do with energy, which is not energy-related. Okay, so to, to start, energy from nuclear fission is a process where you have a slow neutron interacting with the uranium-235 nucleus, which splits this nucleus into two atoms, plus 2.5 fast neutrons, and a lot of large amount of energy. <clears throat> you need one neutron for every chain reaction to continue, and then you have about 1.5 free neutrons to use for other processes. Now, <clears throat> a one gigawatt fission power plant needs about 10 to the 20 fission processes per second. In comparison, <clears throat> deuterium tritium fusion it's a process where you combine deuterium plus tritium, give you helium plus a neutron plus some energy, which is about a factor of 10 smaller than per nuclear fission process. <clears throat> so a hypothetical one gigawatt electric fusion power plants would need about 10 to the 21, or a factor of 10 more fusion reactions per second. So what is the reality of nuclear power today? <clears throat> Here's a diagram of the age of the existing nuclear power plants in the world. You can see that during the last 10 years, on average, about three to four reactors were connected to the grid. Then you had a period from 1980 to 1985, a kind of a peak structure, <coughs> where in the best time, in the best year, 33 reactors were completed per year, or almost three per month. And then you had a pe second peak structure, so-called about 100 reactors, which are now all old between, between 30 and 40 years old. The oldest reactor today oops, is about 40 years old, and you can see from this that during the next 10 to 15 years, about 100 reactors are going to retire. Today, 439 nuclear power plants exist in the world today which have an installed capacity of 371 gigawatt electric power. World electric en energy, is, uh, nuclear power makes electric energy dominantly. In the total, it was 2,768 terawatt hours in 2005, which corresponds to 15.2% of the world's electric energy. The maximum, when you think in terms of fraction, was achieved in 1993, which was 18%. Today, about 30 reactors are under construction, and like during the past four ye 10 years, about three to four reactors are expected to go online with about four gigawatt installed electric power. 
At the same time, about <coughs> three gigawatt electric power will be shut down, which means at best there can be a limited growth rate of 0.3% per year for the next five to 10 years. <coughs> this can also be seen from this diagram where you see here sort of the total electricity production in terawatt hours. We had a steep rise during the 80s and then it flattened out and then some small increase during the last few years. Here you see the fraction of the total world electricity which comes out of nuclear. You had this kind of a <coughs> plateau which reached with 18% in 93 and then going down now to 15.2%. If you know that 16% of the world's energy mix comes from electricity, you multiply this 15% by 16% and you end up that of the total world energy mix, only 2.5% comes from nuclear fission energy. <clears throat> now, fast breeders. The fast reactor operates with so-called prompt fission neutrons. They need a higher enrichment of uranium-235 or plutonium-239 and sodium cooling. Actually, the enrichment comes into areas which is close to bomb building material. Nothing compared to conventional <coughs> nuclear fission reactors. Now, why is it interesting? Because mainly some theoretical ideas, hopes or claims from 30 to 40 years ago said if we can find a way to optimally use these unused 1.5 fission neutrons, then we can increase feasible resources by about a factor of 60. And actually, the, the process uh, involved is <coughs> combining one neutron with uranium-238 to make plutonium, uh, or to have thorium-233 plus a neutron gives uranium-233, <coughs> which, <coughs> in fact, can be used in normal fission reactors. Now, 30 years later, we have heard, when you look in the books back from 30 years, you find many, many nice features of these fast reactors. But in fact, we all know that at least the first type of these reactors was not really a success story. Few countries have tried to construct larger, not very large, but expensive prototype reactors. Today, only one is operating in Russia, and <coughs> uh, it will, will be shut down in a few years from now. Other 12, the other 12 larger fast reactors that never functioned well are now closed or not operating. And in fact, there is very little known, at least openly, about fast reactor running experience. <clears throat> what is the perspective for these fast reactors? Currently, there are two under construction, one in India and one in Russia, and they are expected to start in 2010 and 2012. But it's a fact that no commercially functioning fast breeder exists today. Furthermore, in preparing for this conference during the last few months, I contacted all these sort of uh, companies and international energy agencies and so on to tell me some details on how fast reactors were actually functioning and how much <coughs> plutonium-239 or how large the, breeding fact the chief breeding factors really were. To my surprise and to the surprise of some friends which I have working with nuclear power, nobody was able to come up with a document specifying how much breeding has really been achieved. From the International Atomic Energy and from the World Nuclear Association, I didn't even get an answer. So it seems that actually no public scientific document uh, exists which quantifies what has really been achieved in plutonium, plutonium breeding. So one might conclude with a question that perhaps all these fast reactors were so complicated to operate that none of them has really achieved efficient breeding. Now, <clears throat> at the beginning of 2000, there was a worldwide initiative has started for some kind of nuclear revival. And the idea was to develop new, safe, and very efficient reactors. And they came up with a document in 2002, a so-called roadmap. A very interesting document to read, which I can rec recommend to everybody. And one of the first diagrams in this book is very interesting. In fact, they show kind of a timeline for the next 100 years. And on this side, on the, on the y-axis, they show how much uranium is required to operate <coughs> current and future nuclear fission power. And then you have two lines here, the so-called known resources. 
and so-called speculative resources. And in order, if we run with the normal reactors, which we know how to build and operate, then by the year 2030, we run into a problem with the known, so-called known resources. Now, there's obviously something has to happen. If we wait till 2060, we run into the limit of so-called speculative resources. And what speculative means, you can guess yourself, I guess. Now, the solution was to develop a new type of reactor which should be ready by 2030. And then, once it's employed, amazingly, around 2070, when no other reactors function, these reactors work and function like a perpetuum mobile. Once they are there, they run forever, they don't need any more uranium. Certainly an impossibility in physics. So, but if you go a little bit further into this roadmap, then we see, <clears throat> first, as I said already, they should be ready for commercial production by the year 2030. The goal is to develop high-efficiency fast reactors with a so-called closed fuel cycle, which means that exactly the same amount of fissile material is breeded than which was burned. <clears throat> to, to come to this uh, solution, uh, about six new prototypes were proposed, which should be studied in great detail during the next 10 to 15 years. And, yes, a large amount of research budget was required, about a billion per reactor type. Now, we are five years later, and when you try to find, what has been, find out what has happened during the last five years, you find that, first of all, it seems that almost no funding has been found for these reactors, and that there are no experimental results published during these last five years. I think it is obvious, with little or no funding, we will have little or no results. And it is certainly impossible to have commercial wonder reactors within the next 20 to 30 years. So this brings me to a closer look at uranium requirements. We know very well that a one gigawatt reactor needs about 180 tons of natural uranium equivalent per year. When you start a reactor, in fact, a new reactor, you need about three times more. Today, we have 371 gigawatt electric, which means a total requirement per year is 67,000 tons. When we think about the year 2030, and for sure breeder reactors are not ready, then we can only answer the question how much uranium is required if you know or think, imagine how much the world wants or needs in 2030. Now, <clears throat> this is a guess of everybody, but I give you here two guesses from very pro-nuclear organizations the Nuclear Energy Association from the OECD countries. They said in a study in 2006, uranium resources plenty to sustain growth of nuclear power. This was the title. But when you look into the document, you find that they assume, I mean, this plenty of growth is in fact a one to two percent per year growth at maximum, and this for the next 20 years. A similar document came out just a week ago from the World Nuclear Association and they have the so-called reference scenario for installed power by 2030, which actually is about 50% more than we have today. <clears throat> or they have also two other scenarios, so-called high and low growth scenarios. The high growth scenario is practically a doubling of today's 2.5% contribution to the energy mix, which is still not very much, if you further assume that we want some growth during the next years or the low growth scenario actually is, in fact, a practical phase out of nuclear energy. And then, of course, you can calculate the yearly requirement of uranium, 51,000 to 130,000 tons of uranium. Now, how much uranium is in the ground? If you want to figure this out, you have to go to a so-called red book from the OECD and the International Atomic Energy Administration in Vienna. Now, in this book, you find some fascinating numbers, like the so-called known recoverable uranium resources, which are specified for less than $130 per kilogram. In effect, this number is known so precisely in this book that it's known up to the ton, 3.3 million tons, perhaps better to remember, yeah, which is equivalent to 49 years of today's use. Then you have also inferred resources. What are inferred resources? They are the ones which are expected, expected to exist and extractable with known technology. Also, this number is known with seven digits or down to the ton. 
it doesn't give much credibility on the whole report, I would say. Furthermore, then there's a large number for undiscovered or speculative resources, 7.5 million tons, also quite precisely known. And then we have a very large number for so-called unconventional resources. Unconventional means actually, in the, as is explained in the book, is basically extraction technology does not exist today. <laughs> Now, this is so-called phosphate and seawater. And seawater is a huge number, 4,000 million tons, and of course, such, such a huge number, this can satisfy our thirst for energy for millions of years, perhaps. Now, actually, when you think about it, the concentration in, in seawater is very low, 3 milligrams per cubic meter. Nevertheless, many people claim that this can be extracted for $200 per kilogram, or perhaps, at most, if one is pessimistic, then $1,000 per kilogram, which is still a very small number compared to running cost or building cost of a nuclear power plant. But when you think a little bit more about it, and I would like to do this together with you, so <clears throat> what we know, there was a single huge multi-million dollar experiment which was running over many months, claims to have extracted about one kilogram of uranium from seawater. Now, in particle physics, if there is one experiment which makes an extraordinary claim, usually we don't believe it. And, in fact, there should be very quickly some follow-up experiments to see it. Now, for this experiment so far, there was no follow-up or control experiment has been performed. Now, let's think a little bit more. So, we, I said before how much uranium is required per year. Now, you can easily transform this into how much uranium is burned per year, uh, per second. It's about six grams of uranium per second for one gigawatt electric power. To how much water you have to filter to get the uranium out, and you come up with a number of 10,000 cubic meter per second, and this for 365 days and 24 hours a day. And this over years and years for just one, <coughs> to run just, operate just one reactor, assuming 20% efficiency. Now, how much is 10,000 cubic meter per second? So I've looked for some large rivers, and as being German, I looked to the Rhine, and the Rhine, on average, discharges about 2,000 cubic meter per second into the North Sea. Now, I wish every company who wants to start an enterprise on getting uranium out of, <coughs> out of seawater under such conditions, and for $200 a kilogram, I wish very good luck. <laughs> But when we go further into this red book, and the so-called known resources, there are actually many contradictions besides this incredible precision with, with which all is known. First of all, we know that basically all countries claim that they want to become energy independent. So why actually, if all this would be true, and that uranium is such a minor cost of the whole thing, why did many countries and many mines actually stop producing uranium? Second, we know that, like with oil reserves, when you compare the number for different countries, that the country numbers never seem to decrease, even so uranium is taken out of the ground. And the third point is actually how costs of uranium resources and mining are defined. And I got hold finally of this red book, I was surprised that nothing at all is written about this. But I think for sure, and you, you know all this very well, that <clears throat> together with inflation and higher oil prices, somehow the uranium resource per dollar numbers must change. But this has not happened. So in fact, I think the real question for commercial energy production is not how much uranium is in the ground, but are we, do we know and are we capable to extract the uranium fast enough out of the ground? And when we look at this, there are two interesting diagrams. So the first one is from the World Nuclear Association, uh, <coughs> shown by uh, 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 Mr. Kidd, and this is from January 2007. So he was showing in this diagram, in blue, the uranium which comes out of the existing mines with some optimistic extrapolation for the next five years, five to six years, that this will increase to about 60,000 tons from currently, from today, about 40,000 tons. Then you have some secondary supply from overproduction of uranium during the 70s and the 80s. A large fraction of it is actually in military stockpiles. Now, when you look at this in the next three years, you see already that the situation is very, very tight. 
and to some extent explains why on the stock market at least the uranium price has increased tenfold, which is much larger than, of course, we, have, we know from the oil situation. Now, when you go further, 2015, then you have the three scenarios, so the, the baseline scenario with a moderate growth of about 1.5% per year, this high growth scenario of something like two, a little bit more than 2% per year, and the low growth scenario or phase out scenario, if one would phrase it properly. And you see that, so for the next 10 years or so, basically all three scenarios agree, and then they differ. But if you want to have some growth, which is very moderate, then by the year 2015, you run into a problem because there are no mining projects foreseen after 2015. So out of this already, is a question often being discussed within sort of internal of the mine, mine, mining people on how this is even a 1.5% growth could be satisfied after 2015. But then something happened in 2006, and I think it's not much much different from saying this is a black year for uranium extraction and nuclear energy. Now, actually, as I had shown in the diagram before, it was expected that something like 7,000 tons of uranium would come to the market during the next few years from one particular mine, the so-called Cigar Lake mine, which was expected to start in 2007. Now, in fall 2006, an incident happened, and this underground mine is now completely flooded with water. So, in fact, in the spring of this year, it was announced that it cannot be opened before 2011. And in fact, this incident looks like the nuclear, nuclear equivalent of losing the oil from Saudi Arabia for a few years. In addition, <coughs> we also know that despite that <coughs> the uranium price is very high now, uh, the extraction and mining from, of uranium has not really gone up during the last year. In 2006, the total number was 39,400 39, tons, and 2005 was about 5% higher. We also know <coughs> that the first half year results from Canada already coming out. Canada makes, produces about 25% of the world uranium, and the results are even lower in 2007 than in 2006, which was already a, somewhat a record low year. Thus, <coughs> Now, this plot has been updated, actually, which I have shown you before, at least partially, by one of the big players in the uranium mining companies, Newchem. And this was shown in February 2007. And when you look here, so you have the primary mine production adjusted. You see kind of here this dip because of the failing Cigar Lake mine, which at that time was believed to start maybe 2008 or so. So you see this usual, usual increase again. And in fact, when you look at the number, 2007 or 2006, we have just seen the final number was 39,000 tons, not 41,000 tons. Now, if you add secondary supply, so up to 2007, you just made it to fulfill all the requirements to run, operate all the reactors. And then the next three years will be very interesting for the nuclear industry. There's a clear gap of something of at least 5,000 tons of uranium per year. Now, there are only two solutions, in my view, for the next few years, and it's either that 5 to 10 percent of the world reactor fleet, or 20 to 40 gigawatts, will be without uranium, no matter what the price is, or we have some kind of a divine intervention, which I would very much like, that, for example, all nuclear weapons will be converted in all the big nuclear weapon players of the world. But I think, it, especially in the current situation, this seems to be very, very unlikely. Now, out of this, the question comes, if nuclear fission power would ever recover from this uranium shortage, this seems to be clear, clearly written on the wall for the next few years. Okay, so I will <coughs> come to the last part, yes. Uh, nuclear fusion illusions. Now, <coughs> you have heard during the last 30 to 40 years that nuclear fusion is about 50 years away. Now, this timeline has passed many times now, but as you can see, for example, from the European Study Group in this document here, uh, there's a 50-year program on how to come to commercial <coughs> for a prototype power station for fusion energy. So it says, first step, 10 billion euro project ITER, which is now being started in southern France. Uh, 
should operate from 2007 to 2030, which should be followed by a so-called demonstration step, which is being started, supposed to be in 2020 going to 2040, with undefined costs and proto, the so-called prototype power station, which might be ready by 2060. Now, during the last years, you could find many articles in the media on how easy fusion actually will be. And one diagram here from BBC shows how that it's all very easy. So you have some kind of plasma in this inner core surrounded by a magnet. Then neutrons come out, they transport the energy. This is transformed to heat. And the heat then goes to water, makes steam, and operates a, a turbine, like in every other power plant which we have. Now, <clears throat> this was even sort of more impressive when you look at media headlines. And here's, here are three examples. If successful, ITER would provide mankind with an unlimited source of energy. Or BBC News, officials project that 10 to 20% of the world's energy could come from fusion by the end of the century. When you compare this with this number which we have after 50 years of, of nuclear fission energy, that only 2.5% of the world energy mix comes from nuclear power, something which we understand very well how it functions, then you get amazed. Furthermore, ITER says, I mean the machine says, not the people, ITER says within 30 years, electricity could be available on the grid. So what is nuclear fusion all about? We know from physics reasons, basic physics reasons, I don't have time, time to go into details, that the only reaction which is imaginable on, imaginable on our Earth is the fusion of deuterium plus tritium. This gives helium plus a neutron with 14 MeV. Basically, all the energy is within the neutron. Tritium does not exist naturally and must be made somehow. In fact, how much tritium do you need? To run a hypothetical uh, reactor with 1,000 megawatt thermal uh, and a continuous running must burn something like 56 kilograms of tritium per year. But we know also very well that only a few kilograms per year can be extracted, supplied from existing fission reactors. Thus, it is well known that a real fusion reactor must achieve, safe, uh, must have achieved tritium self-sufficiency. Thus, it means that more tritium must be made and extracted than burned. And in fact, there's a reaction proposed and this reaction is, requires that every neutron which comes out of the fusion reaction is used again to make another tritium atom which then has to be extracted. Now, the reaction given is not neutron plus lithium gives helium plus tritium plus some energy. Now, <clears throat> before I go with one slide into the details of this, uh, of this tritium breeding chain, just let me mention some other fundamental barriers which <clears throat> are so large that it is important to remember them. First of all, if you think of commercial energy production, and I think this is what we are interested in, then we require some kind of steady state, one gigawatt electric power plant operation, like a good, well-known uh, nuclear fission power plant. This requires running for years and not for minutes. So at best, sort of the most optimistic goal for ITER timeline by 2022 is to have a 400 second pulse with a 0.5 gigawatt thermal energy production. So certainly many, many orders of magnitude away from what we, we would need from a, from a reactor. Secondly, the high temperature of something like 100 million degrees and <clears throat> high, the high neutron flux in the, coming out of a real reactor requires some material which is currently unknown. Unfortunately, such neutron-resistant material cannot be developed or tested with ITER and, and, and nowhere else. And the third point is the tritium handling is actually, as I said, a running a hypothetical one gigawatt electric reactor, not thermal, requires to burn at least 200 kilograms of tritium per year. The ITER experiments, which are sort of actually a second phase only with tritium operating, they require at best a few kilograms per year. So for ITER, there is no problem, but ITER has nothing to do with energy, commercial energy production. And thus, the external tritium sources are well known that at best, by 2027, there can be 30 kilograms worldwide. And the first point is the impossible self-sustained 
breeding chain, which in fact, when you look at several documents and you study them in detail and read a little bit critical, you can read all, that all, everything is known, that we know enough that it's not functioning. So, first, the known so-called fractional tritium burn up in jet and ether, so existing experiments which had very short pulses of tritium fusion, uh, it was about one in a million, but a real reactor is well known to require something like a few percent of this tritium breeding fraction. So there's a, at least a factor of 10,000 missing for a real fusion reactor. Then everything done so far is done with computer simulations, and these computer simulations that even under very idealistic simulations, that they, in, they indicate that <coughs> there's the possible achievable breeding factor is far too small. On top of it, tritium extraction and transfer efficiency have never been studied. <coughs> and then, since a few years, there are some very simplified neutron lithium breeding experiments being done. And what one figured out is that all computer simulations are sy systematically far too optimistic and thus wrong. And finally, <coughs> the real tritium breeding experiment cannot be done with realistically high neutron flux, neither with ITER nor anywhere else. And you can see all this in this publication by some of the world experts on, on fusion and tritium breeding from, from the United States. And in fact, this is Professor Abdu, who is the director of the Fusion Science and Technology Center in UCLA. He gave a talk to the Department of Energy office in June 2003, which I recommend very, mu very, every much, very much to, to everybody to read. And I just give three quotes from his presentation. There is not a single experiment yet in the fusion environment to show that the deuterium fusion, deuterium tritium fusion cycle is viable. Second, tritium supply and self-sufficiency are go, no-go issues for fusion energy as critical now as demonstrating a burning plasma. And third, what should we do to communicate this message to those who influence fusion, fusion policy outside of the Department of Energy? Well, I hope that this presentation helps to communicates this message a little bit at least. And this brings me to the conclusion about the nuclear option. First, the fraction of world's electricity coming out of nuclear, from nuclear fission is going down. The maximum was in 1993, and it's now 15.2%. There might be plenty of uranium in the ground, but we don't know the extraction technologies. And even a modest increase in nuclear power seems to be excluded for the next couple of 10 a couple of decades. For the next three years, we run into severe supply problems, which can only be solved by a divine intervention, or 5 to 10 percent of the world reactors have to be shut down. Commercial fast breeder and fast reactors, so-called Generation 4, do not exist right now, and no proof exists that Generation 4 reactors might eventually work. But for sure, without large amount of research money, these reactors will not be ready in 2030. And fifth, self-sustained deuterium tritium fusion chain is impossible to achieve under large-scale fusion conditions. Thus, commercial <coughs> nuclear fusion energy will always be 50 years away. And in summary, energy shortages from oil and gas depletion cannot be compensated with nuclear energy. Thank you for your attention.